Okay, guys, this is your first exam review for maternity. And, oh, hang on, close this out. And for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Natalie, and I'm the NFT for the course. And then we also have Isabella. Do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> Hi, I'm Isabella. I'm the TA. Great. Okay, so exam topics for this first exam, again, are going to include that postpartum and newborn assessments. It's going to be covering the uncomplicated postpartum as well as the uncomplicated newborn, um, breastfeeding and or lactation, um, and a little bit of math. Don't be intimidated by that. If math gets to you, there's only a couple problems and they are really straightforward. Okay, so the uncomplicated postpartum and maternal assessment. So some important things to know for mom, you wanna find out, um, does she have plans to breastfeed? So don't just automatically assume that every mom has plans to breastfeed. Um, some do not because of medical reasons. Um, some may just decide it's not for them. Um, so find out if it is for them, if they plan to breastfeed. Obviously, we always want to encourage um, breastfeeding because breast milk is uh, the best thing for babies, um, but just determining that early on is good. We also want to determine if they are RH positive or RH negative. Um, this is gonna be really important for the second pregnancy, second potential pregnancy that mom may have. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we always want to find out in our assessment when she last urinated or if she um, has just delivered. The first thing we really want to focus on doing is getting her up and using the bathroom and trying to get her to urinate. Um, often they'll say to you, you know, I really, really don't have to go. Um, you just try to encourage them to try. Um, what that might look like is you standing in the doorway of the bathroom and just saying, okay, just, you know, sit there a few minutes and just see. If anything happens, you can turn the faucet on for them. I remember doing that with one of my moms. Um, it's super important that you get them to at least try to because um, it could be an issue with postpartum hemorrhage if they ha are they retaining um, a full bladder. Um, we'll focus a little bit more on that soon. Um, you wanna figure out uh, if this is her first pregnancy, her first delivery, or if she's a multi-para. So if she has had multiple pregnancies, multiple deliveries that have resulted in offspring, that's multi-para. Um, those two spectrums, so like first baby or lots of babies that the mom has had, are both risks for postpartum hemorrhage. Um, you wanna determine what mom's mental status is. So. Something you may see that's pretty common um, in the first um, days of the aftermath of delivery is postpartum blues. So just being aware of that, about 60 to 80% of uh, women who have delivered babies often do have postpartum blues. And we'll talk a little bit more about that soon as well. Um, and then you also wanna make sure that mom is using adequate hand hygiene when she's using the bathroom and or changing her peri pads. So um, just educating her on the importance of this because it is an infection risk. Okay, so maternal assessment, we use the bubble he or bubble ear. Um, Isabel, you wanna take breaths? Hi, yeah, okay. So um, as you guys should know, we're no longer palpating the breast when we are um, doing a breast breast examination, um, we can just look at it. We don't need to be touching them in that area. Um, so you wanna inspect by visu visualization um, and you just wanna ask mom a few questions like um, if there's any tenderness, any soreness, any pain at all. You also wanna note if there's any um, redness, any cracks or any bruising. Um, and then also you wanna notice any like um, any issues with breastfeeding in the beginning um, just because if there are any issues with latching then we might want to get a lactation consultant for mom um, you also want to inspect for 
symmetry in the breast as well as the shape of the nip nipples. Like if they're inverted, um, then you might have to change how you're going to have them breastfeed. I don't know if you want to add anything, Natalie. Yeah, that actually just sparked um, a thought of mine. So yeah, there's different nipples that moms have. Um, they may have inverted or everted nipples, um, and sometimes they will need a nipple shield to be able to breastfeed, and it's basically like a little plastic shield that would go over the nipple in order for her to be able to adequately breastfeed her infant. So you may or may not see those, but if you do, that's what those are. <laughs> Okay, so uterus and bladder. So the fundus should be midline and firm like a grapefruit. If it becomes boggy or like marshmallow-like, um, what do we do? You guys can throw it into the chat. It's the first thing you wanna do if it becomes massage boggy. The... Yeah. yeah, you're gonna massage the fundus. You're gonna get it to refirm itself. Um, that's really important to make sure that mom does not bleed out. Um, the fidal, fidal, the fundal height descends one centimeter a day after delivery. So you can see over here what that looks like and it just kind of descends down and will return to its natural station. Um, but this is the general shape too of what the fundus looks like. Um, it returns to normal by day 14, which is below the pubic, pubic symphysis and will become non-palpable at that point. It sh uh, at this point, they should no longer be having any cramping related to the involution. Um, if there is a displacement or deviation with the fundus when you're doing your assessment, you want to ask them when did you urinate last. It's the first thing we're going to ask them and then get them to, to urinate and then reassess that. Again, a full bladder is a postpartum hemorrhage risk. That's a biggie in this course. Um, you want to encourage them to be trying to go to the bathroom urinating at least two hour, every two hours. Um, and also like if she's just delivered and especially with C-sections, they don't really have their legs back. Um, you wanna be assisting moms to the bathroom and making sure that they are being safe about it. They are a fall risk. Um, they have this, they have a desensitization of the urge to urinate for a couple different reasons. So it could be due to the fluid pressures um, that go unnoticeable to them. And it could also be that their urinary structures have become edematous. Um, they start really picking up their, their diuresis about 12 hours postpartum as well. Okay, so lochia lacerations and episiotomies. So episiotomies, mm-hmm. Would you mind just going back to the previous slide? Yeah, totally. Okay, I just needed to read that one thing. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question on this slide. Sure. sure. Okay, so uh, I keep hearing how uh, if the fundus feels boggy that we should massage it out. Um, I just want to understand how the massaging helps in how you should be massaging it. So just in circles is good is the way I've always thought of it, um, what it, it's stimulating that involution process. So it's gonna, it's gonna reform itself back up. So it's gonna send a trigger to the brain to start secreting, I think, oxytocin again. So that way it, it does firm back up. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. Okay. So lochia lacerations and episiotomies. So as a point, like episiotomies are actually not routinely done as they once were. Um, allowing a mom to tear naturally if they do it all is actually much better for the healing process. There has been studies surrounding this and showing that th they heal so much better if they just tear naturally opposed to doing cutting. Um, with, with these lacerations, you wanna be making sure with your assessments that you are inspecting the perineum with each maternal assessment. Um, if, you know, we we do get concerned about like redness and swelling, there might be a little bit there obviously in the first day. So helping to reduce that, um, you're gonna have ice packs within that first 24 hours to that area. 
And then after that, they are encouraged to do the sitz baths a couple times a day to help with that. There's also antiseptic creams and sprays they can use. Um, tucks are really, really common on the units, so you will see those. And essentially, those are like witch hazel pads. And witch hazel has a really, really great um, like anti-inflammatory property, um, which is why they're really beneficial for something like lacerations. Um, important to know, postpartum hemorrhage is like constituted if there is a saturated pad like with blood within 15 minutes. Even within an hour, it's a big red flag. Um, you want to change it out and reassess. So the way uh, Lokia progresses, so what's normal and what's not. So day one through four, it's going to have that bright red appearance. Um, it's going to be a heavier flow. There may be some smaller medium clots. Um, don't be alarmed by that. But like if it's larger than two inches in diameter, then it's a big problem. Um, day four through 10, it's gonna be more of a pinkish color. There's gonna be less apparent like blood. Um, there's gonna be more discharge and fewer clots. Day 10 through 28, um, they will have, it's mostly gonna be like a whitish, but could be a little bit of yellow. Typical of like what normal discharge may look like. Um, and there will be little to no clots. Um, red flags are if the bleeding stops or slows and then picks back up again, that's a big red flag. Um, if they're soaking through a pad within an hour, that's a red flag. Um, and then if they have fever or flu-like symptoms or if they're having abdominal pain, and they may have the, the normal cramping, um, but if it's actually like they're saying that, you know, I'm having like abdominal pain, um, that's definitely a red flag. Um, they may ask, you know, why do you bleed after birth or like, what is Lokia? They may want education. So this is basically uh, the healing site for where your placenta separated from your uterus. So essentially the placenta was like a big, scab within the uterus that was ripped off, ripped out of the uterus, um, and hopefully in one whole piece. Often, you know, the surgeon will be really careful to make sure it comes out in one piece. And if you guys have a chance to see the placenta and kind of like examine it and while you're in a room with a, a patient who just delivered, I highly encourage like looking at that as well as like watching the whole process that they do afterwards because it is a super fascinating organ. Um, also, the body is naturally releasing extra fluids, blood, and tissue from pregnancy. So some self-care for this, you wanna have them wearing cotton undies, there's peri bottles to keep it clean, um, they have cool compresses to keep any like swelling down, and also those herbal sits baths. Okay, I wanted to throw this one in here because hormones, I'm like replacing that with hormones and the bubble heat because there's lots of important hormones with moms who have just delivered and we no longer do hormones, right? So looking at, let me move this up. Looking at progesterone and estrogen here, it returns to normal within that first week here. So this is one week and we follow that. And you can see that that both of those come down to normal levels within that first week postpartum. Prolactin drops slightly after delivery, but with breastfeeding moms, it will remain elevated for about six weeks. Um, with prolactin, you wanna encourage baby to breast as much as possible. Um, Non-nutritive suckling is great. It will aid in uh, the prolactin receptor site development within that first three to five days postpartum. Uh, also non-nutritive suckling for baby, it can be really soothing and help calm baby as well. The human placental lactogen hormone drops dramatically right after birth um, because the placenta is expelled, right? Or it should be. Hopefully there's no placental fragments left behind or any of that. So that we will see dropping immediately right at birth.
Okay, so emotions and extremities. Isabella, you want to take this one? So, um, you always, with most like patients in the hospital, you always um, want to be checking their legs because, um, uh, especially with giving birth, you have risk for DVT. Um, so, you want to make sure you check those um, pulses and the legs and then the feet and the ankles. Um, you want to check uh, if there's any change in color, like if it's one leg red and one normal color. Also, um, is there any warmth in the legs at all? Any um, asymmetry and warmth? Uh, you always want to check the cap refill in the toes. Um, and then also, if they aren't ambulating yet, you want to encourage the use of those SCDs. Um, but also with um, postpartum, you do want to encourage early ambulation. Um, our moms have um, a a higher risk for developing a pulmonary embolism. So that's why that's important. Um, also, while you're doing this assessment, you just want to um, kind of like pick up on their emotions, how they're feeling. You can ask them how they're feeling, if they're, you know, if you detect any type of like stress, um, kind of like have, like it says here, like having an organic conversation with the mom. And you also want to know the difference between the postpartum blues and postpartum depression. So the post postpartum blues, it's um, mild mood disturbances. Um, it usually begins like postpartum day three and lasts a few days. Um, and like Natalie said before, 60% to 80% of, um, of women experience it. Um, and it usually is normal, um, unless, of course, it continues um, and it doesn't kind of resolve itself. Um, whereas postpartum depression, it is, you know, very serious. Um, it usually uh, starts to develop postpartum, four to six weeks postpartum. Um, and it is actually very common, like it's 20%, which is not like a super high percentage, but 20% is still a lot. So it's important to educate mom to, you know, at the follow up um, to talk about how they're feeling. You know, it's, it's, it's about mom and baby, not just baby. Thanks, Isabella. That was great. Um, one more thing I want to add with postpartum blues and depression. Um, a good way to differentiate blues is like the acute and then depression is like the chronic. And also what's important to know is that we won't give medication for postpartum blues, but often um, medication will probably be needed for postpartum depression and it can, it can last a long time. So think of that more of like chronic long term and they are going to need medication for that. Or they likely will need medication for it. I have a quick question about extremities. Yeah. Um, so with, um, with like a vaginal delivery, I guess like they're only in the hospital for 24 to 48 hours after birth. Right. Mm -hmm. So I wonder like, what is considered early ambulation? Um, if a mom has, um, an epidural versus if she doesn't have an epidural, like how soon can we be getting right her? after birth? <laughs> Literally, so like, has the epidural, that's why I'm saying, like, yes, you will two, walk with her. Or, okay. You will walk with her to the bathroom and help. Like, she, you ask her, like, how are your legs feeling right now? But um, that should be starting to wear off, like, right after delivery time. Okay. Um, after they, you know, fix her up and all of that, like, she should be able to detect if, like, her, she might have some numbness, but that's why you're there to, like, help support her and ambulate her. The SEDs are going to be more of a thing that you will probably see with C-section patients. Okay. Um, yeah, but good Thank question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so rubella and rogam. So rogam is ordered post delivery if mom is Rh negative and baby is Rh positive. It's given to moms because they are non immune um, postpartum, and this will protect. Uh, future pregnancies, basically. Mom should not plan to get pregnant for the next four weeks. Um, and why is that? Why do we not give rubella vaccine during pregnancy? It's a live virus and it could endanger the baby. Birth defects, yeah. Good job. 
Um, so this is a really great immunology diagram here showing exactly what is happening. So here's first pregnancy with baby and baby has her, her his uh, red blood cells with the Rh antigen. Um, so if mom was not to get Rogam post pregnancy, basically the antibodies that go to mom from baby during delivery, um, the this would elicit a response by the immune system to create um, the it would activate B cells and then um, basically from that they would create memory cells, right? And that would attack baby. So in order for that not to happen, we give Rogan. Does that make sense? I know it's like kind of a tricky concept to get, but I thought this diagram is really great in showing the way the whole process goes. And feel free to take a screenshot of this if you would like it. I just think of it too as like opposite of a of a vaccine. It kind of like blocks the antibodies, takes it away. So um, mom doesn't have, you know, an immune response to that second um, RH negative or RH positive baby. Yeah, good point. Okay. Do you want to do postpartum hemorrhage risks? Yeah, so um, as we were saying before, um, you always want to ask mom uh, when the last time they peed. You always want to encourage um, them to use the bathroom because a full or distended bladder can actually um, displace the uterus. So it can um, make it move to the side and it won't, it doesn't allow itself to kind of um, go through that involution process. So um, that uh, puts mom at risk for postpartum hemorrhage. Also, of course, if it's a very long um, precipitous labor, um, which is typical with new moms. Um, so if it's always important to know if it's the first pregnancy or um, if they've had a few pregnancies, kind of like um, to always be on alert for postpartum hemorrhage. Um, as well as if they've had many, many pregnancies, that's also a risk for postpartum hemorrhage. Um, and then let's see, the first thing we do when mom is, or what's the first thing we do when um, we do see signs of hemorrhaging? Said it earlier. That's the big one in maternity. Oh, massage the fundus or? Yeah, the, the... yeah you guys are getting it. Yeah, so you want to massage the fundus, and of course, if that doesn't help it, you want to call um, that postpartum hemorrhage code. And then, you know, a whole team comes in, they have a whole protocol on what to do. Um, Natalie, did you want to talk about that over descended uterus? Yeah, so over descended uterus, this can happen with fetal macrosomia, so a really, really large baby. Um, and basically, it's um, you know, if it's overstretched, like those receptors might not be like as good as bouncing back um, in the involution process. So they could potentially be at postpartum hemorrhage risk, um, multiple pregnancies again. So new moms, multiple pregnancies. New moms are always a priority to go see, to go assess, um, because they could be one or the other, a prolonged or precipitous. So either like a really, really long labor, or they came in and that baby flew out of them. Both could be a risk for postpartum hemorrhage because the body is like, oh my God, how do I respond to this, right? Um, yeah, great job, Isabella. Okay, so an uncomplicated newborn and newborn assessment. So APGAR scoring, um, we do this at one minute, one minute and three minutes after the baby has been delivered. A score of seven to 10 is good. Um, also know that a score of 10 is super uncommon. Um, you're more typically going to see a score of like an eight or nine. Um, know that acrocyanosis here, what's pictured here is actually super common and it's okay, it's normal. Um, where baby's lips might be blue and the extremities might be blue, but the rest of the body is pink. Um, 
when baby comes out, you're going to be drying baby thoroughly directly after delivery. Um, and you'll be like, this will be done simultaneous as you're like doing your APGAR assessment and then you'll be calling out the APGAR. Um, you guys will get a chance to do a lot of this or be part of the team that's doing it, whether that's the NICU team in the OR or if you're with a vaginal birth. Um, sometimes with the C-sections, uh, those babies don't get that natural compression of their lungs coming out and they may have fluid in the airway. Um, that will definitely need to be, you know, suctioned out. Um, but again, like I say, you know, you, 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 you guys are doing these things, but for these specific things, um, the NICU team is doing a lot of it or the pediatrician is there on site. There's a lot of moving people in the rooms doing this, especially in the OR. Um, you want to stabilize and get baby skin to skin as soon as possible with mom. That's definitely a priority to get her skin to skin um, with the baby. Um, because it helps regulate a bunch of different things. And we will get to that, but I wanted to go through APGAR scoring real quick. So the way we score this is we look at their appearance, right? Their overall skin color. This baby has acrocyanosis, so they would score a one. If they are completely blue or pale, they're going to score a zero for this criteria. If they have no cyanosis at all, they come out completely pink and beautiful, they get a two. Um, for pulse rate, if it's less, less than 60, um, that's not really a great sign, but uh, they would score a zero there. If it's between 60 and 100, they would score a one. And then if it's above 100 beats per minute, it would score a two. For grimace, if they have no response to simulation, um, they score a zero. If they have, if you are aggressively simulating the baby for the APGAR scoring and they cry upon that, they would score a one. And then if they cry upon any stimulation, they score a two. For activity or like tone of their like their muscles and their their extremities, if they are absent or floppy, they're gonna score a zero. If there's some flexion of those extremities, they'll score a one. And then if they're like really like flexing and they're resistant to like extending their legs when you try to put their legs down, that's gonna score a two. For respiratory effort, if it's absent, they'll score a zero. If it's weak or they are gasping, they'll score a one. And then if they have a strong cry, that's definitely gonna be indicative of great respiratory and they'll score a two. APGAR makes sense to you guys? Just want to make sure there's no questions. This acrocyanosis only, oh, I didn't see that. Isabel, can you read that chat to me? Question on acrocyanosis. Does it only include extremities or lips as well? It so can it's include only the extremities. Lips. Oh. <laughs> it can include the lips. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, Sorry. It's not like su <laughs> like super common, but um, if the lips are blue, that's that's part of acrocyanosis. It's pictured right here, and then if you look up like the formal definition, you will see that. But often, um, it might just be like just the hands too, right? It might not be like full arms. It might just be just hands. It might just be the toes and the feet. That's still acrocyanosis. It's not the full pink throughout the body, which would be no cyanosis. Okay. So basically, there's different degrees of acrocyanosis. There's another question here. It says, mm -hmm. is APGAR recorded at one minute um, and then three minutes because they were told it was one minute and then five minutes? Um, My notes, I have one and then three minutes. I thought it was one and I think it's one and three. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know if they set a clock. I, I really don't know. Um, yeah. Our clinical instructor, we were asking her about that um, when we were on our like Zoom meeting or whatever, like what, because we were a little bit confused that one of the review sessions said one and three, um, the HESI, um, questions say one and five, mm 
go with Hesse questions. And then our and then our <laughs> because that's teacher does like she's it's Tony Nguyen, so she's the one who does like all, all the resuscitations for the babies and stuff like that. So she's literally, you know, that's literally a huge part of what she does. So she was like, it's one in five minutes, and then every five minutes until there's either a satisfactory score or it's clear that the baby is in big trouble. So that's we're just wanting to like not for the purposes of the exam <laughs> at this point, right. we're wanting to make sure that if it said like three minutes or five minutes that we're not gonna screw it up essentially, if that makes sense. If Hesse says one in five for test taking purposes, go with one in five. Um, I honestly don't know if they like set any sort of like time clock to have it be five minutes or if it's like between three and five kind of deal depending on the, the team that's in there. I, I don't know for sure, um, but if Hesse and the majority of like the resources that you guys have been hearing, say one in five, go with that. Great Good question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so newborn assessment. You wanna take vitals, Isabella? Yeah, so um, the vitals that you're doing for a newborn baby, it's respiratory rate, heart rate, and temperature. Um, we're not taking blood pressure. It's not necessary unless, you know, um, there's an emergency and the NICU is involved, then they'll be taking the blood pressure. But um, the respiratory rate, as you guys know, is 30 to 60. Um, you want to count it for a full minute. Um, and you'll also want to note that they might have um, some short periods of apnea. Less than 15 seconds is considered normal you know, greater than that, 30 seconds, um, you want to intervene, call a code if needed. Um, heart rate is 110 to 160. Um, you want to auscultate at the apical pulse um, for one full minute. Um, and then the temperature is, um, for a newborn is uh, 36.5 to 37.4 degrees Celsius. Um, and then 97.5 to 99.3 um, degrees Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. That range will um, kind of change depending on the hospital you're at, but um, pretty much those ranges will be considered normal. Um, hypothermia is always a major concern. Um, so even if it's like 0.1, um, degree below normal, you want to intervene and do that skin to skin contact because it can escalate um, pretty quickly and lead to respiratory distress for the baby. Great job, Isabella. Um, yeah, I would say that temperature as vitals is probably like the most important to like really keep your eye on know that both respiratory rate and heart rate can slightly be out of range especially if the baby is crying um, it might be beyond you know that 60 or 160 um, top like limit uh, not limit but you know that top end of the spectrum for respiratory and heart rate it might be beyond that and that's just normal because baby's crying and fussing the temperature is definitely going to be like the more important vital to like if that goes out of range just a little bit we want to correct it as soon as possible again like if they become hypothermic it's a major concern because they could go into respiratory distress just know that it's really important and this is particularly really important in the NICU with preemies. Would you mind repeating what you were saying about the potential apnea 15 seconds or more or something like that? So, um, yeah, if they're, if they have apnea for like, if they have that periodic apnea for like about if it goes on for 15 seconds, that you might want to bring to the attention of your nurse that you're working with, and they can bring it to the attention of the health caregiver. If it's a periodic apnea of 30 seconds or more, you're going to call a code. Okay. Um, okay. I, put, I specifically put a picture of cap it on here um because i didn't really see like i got like little um animation figures in like our lecture before going in to lnd and then when baby started popping out 
they all had like these alien like heads and um <laughs> i'm just like oh, <laughs> this is crazy looking to me and you know they're really good at the nurses are really good about getting those cute NICU caps on them so it covers them up because they are kind of crazy looking and for me if I was a parent I wasn't like prepared to see that I'd be like what is wrong with my baby's head right um so this is really really common and normal within the first day or two and then it's just the swelling across those sutures and then it'll come back down um but just be prepared for that because you might be a little like alarmed and like oh my gosh they look like little cone heads right um so this is an example of the caput uh i'm not going to even attempt to say the the second half of that what it's called because i can't say it um, there's also cephalohematoma, both of these. Um, so it goes in like order, the caput cephalohematoma and subgaleal hemorrhage. These go in order of like, not a concern to a concern. The cephalohematoma is not a super concern. It's a slight concern. It needs to be watched. There's more blood pooling there. The subgaleal hemorrhage is definitely more of a concern and it could lead to a, a life-threatening complication um, and that definitely needs to be watched. Um, don't worry about like being able to differentiate these based on like your inspection of the baby too much. Um, you can ask your nurse questions if you have questions about the head. But overall, when you're looking at the head, you're looking for symmetry. You're trying to see that it's normal cephalic of appropriate size. Um, you're also looking at the eyes, right? Making sure that they're symmetrical along with the other things that are on the head, the ears, not things, but <laughs> the parts of the head, ears, nose, mouth, you're inspecting everything on the head. You wanna look at suck and rooting reflexes to make sure that they're intact. So rooting, you're kind of taking and you're running your finger across and that will help them get to the breast to mom. Uh, the sucking reflex, I test as well and listening to heart rate because it actually soothes them and helps you listen to the heart rate uh, a little bit better. Um, you'll learn your little techniques and your ways as well, whatever works for you. Um, and then you can also be checking the palate at the same time, right? Making sure that that's all intact, that there's no, you know, abnormalities there. And then also know for the eyes, we are giving that erythromycin ointment um, in the first day of life that prevents bacterial eye infections in that newborn stage of life. Want to take chest and abdomen? There's a lot here, so <laughs> you cool with this? Or you want me to take it? Yeah, I got it. Okay. Um, so for um, the umbilical cord, it usually falls off around seven to ten days. Um, there is cord care that you do need to teach parents. Um, so you want it to a lot. You want to tell parents that it should dry naturally. Um, and then it'll just fall off on its own. So you want to keep it open to air as much as possible. You don't want to cover it or apply any type of ointment to the cord. So when you go into the hospitals, um, your nurse will kind of show you how to put a diaper on a newborn. They'll fold the, um, the top half of the diaper. So underneath that cord, so it doesn't irritate it at all. Um, and you want to teach mom um, or the parents how to put on a diaper when they still have the cord on. You also wanna let them know that they shouldn't be submerged in a bath um, until that umbilical cord falls off. So you wanna teach them that they can do sponge baths only. Um, and as I said here too, like roll the diaper down away from the cord um, because if there is something um, constantly rubbing it, it could cause an infection or irritation. So um, there could be some bleeding, um, it'll uh, not allow it to dry up, so it'll stay soft and moist. It can also um, have a discharge or have foul orders, which is um, signs of infection or the redness, the erythema. Um, and then when looking at the chest and the abdomen, um, you want to measure the head um, and measure the chest. So um, when you measure the chest, it should be measured at the nipple line. Um, and then when you measure the head, it should be about two centimeters. Um, the chest should be two centimeters smaller than the head. 
two centimeters um, larger. Also, Sorry, that might be confusing the way I wrote it. So the head is actually two centimeters. Um, oh no, sorry, that's correct. Chest is uh, two centimeters smaller than head. Sorry, it's been a long day. That's <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we also want to note that the babies are belly breathers um, with some chest movement. Um, uh, like we were saying before, um, notice those, um, um, if they have apnea and how long it, it lasts. Um, you also want to note if there's any signs of respiratory distress, um, you know, like adults, like you learned in med surge, that nasal flaring, the use of accessory muscles, intercostal retraction, um, you know, any change in color in the baby, are they, um, were they, you know, a normal color before and now they're looking a little blue. Um, and then also, do they have that grunting? And um, it's important to note that um, newborns, newborns, they don't do that cute cooing sound. Um, and sometimes parents will be like, oh, like my baby's cooing, it's so cute. And you want to like, recognize that and, you know, do a little respiratory assessment on the baby because it is going to be that grunting, um, which is a sign of respiratory distress. Um, and uh, yeah, also you want to look at the color of them, you know, you also want to note that, you know, not all babies will be pink, there are brown babies, so you want to look at those other regions like um, their mouth or their eyes and kind of see if there's any um, changes in those areas. Um, and it's also important to note that um, skin to skin is very, very important um, with, it could be mom or it can be dad, it can be any caregiver really, but um, it really promotes bonding and also thermoregulation and also even the involution for, um, for mom. So it, if the baby's cold, if you do skin to skin, it'll, for some, reason I don't know the 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 path of that but it just regulates the baby's temperature and it also releases the oxytocin for mom to have those contractions of the uterus to go to um go down um and yeah that's all I have want to add anything Natalie no oh, it's great uh let's see so yeah I think we talked about cold stress a little bit um, so, again, just knowing that them becoming hypothermic is a real big concern because it leads to respiratory complications. It will exasperate, exacerbate the respiratory distress. Um, again, this is a major concern with preterm infants in the NICU. Um, and then, let me just see if there was one more thing that I wanted to add. Yeah, I really like that you added in that, um, you know, that thoracic abdominal region tends to look pink, but it may not be pink for every skin color type. You may have an African-American baby and the best way to check to make sure that there's no signs of hypothermia with uh, those babies could be like the same way you would, you would look for, um, you know, hypothermia in an adult patient. So, uh, that buccal mucosa so you could be looking at. Um, the exterior, obviously, that could still be part of acrocyanosis, but we'll be looking on the inside, um, be looking at capillary refill, um, just checking overall, like, their, um, how their, their blood is flowing through the body and making sure that they're having adequate, adequate oxygenation. Um, but ultimately, the best way to make sure that they are not becoming hypothermic or, you know, um, hyperthermic even is to be taking temperatures and doing their vitals routinely. Okay, so extremities. Um, so arms have bilateral movement and you may assess for the moral effects, but if your baby is kind of swinging his arms around like this at you um, in the bassinet or wherever you're doing your assessment, um, that's indicative of that moral reflex already being intact. You don't need to, at that point, pick up the baby's arms and do that um, because if they're able to do that, then that reflex is basically intact. 
uh, the grass reflex. That is the super cute one where you put your finger in the baby's bum and they're going to just close their fingers down on you. And it's so cute. Um, legs should be equal in length and they should have those symmetrical gluteal folds. So you'll see that on the backs of their, their thighs, when you pull them down, you'll be able to see that like those are symmetrical. And this is just looking to see if there's any hip dysplasia. The Babinski reflex is where those uh, toes will fan outward when you stroke the sole of the foot. Uh, this should disappear by one year of age. If it doesn't disappear or if you, you see this on an adult patient, that's always like indicative of like a neurogenic um, abnormality. Um, so yeah, it'll disappear about one years of age. For injections, they will be given in that anterior lateral thigh portion for baby. Um, and on that first day, they should be given the, those vitamin K injection or just one vitamin K injection and then the one hepatitis B injection. Uh, these are super important because the neonatal gut lacks the vitamin K synthesizing bacteria and it becomes a huge risk for vitamin K deficient bleeding. Um, and then the hepatitis B needs to be given for early protection because they do not have the immune system to fight against hepatitis. Both of these are IM injections and will be given at 90 degrees. You may see that depending on the nurse, it might not be like directly like 90 degrees. It might be slightly like 75, 80 degrees. Um, every nurse does it a little bit different from what I was seeing. I was like, huh. Um, again, don't like question your nurse. <laughs> Just know that you know, they primarily know what they're doing. That's their specialty that they're in. Um, feel free to ask them questions about their um, process with what they do. Okay, skin. So they will have, um, or no, not will, they may have any of these. So Epstein pearls are tiny white bumps on the gums. Milia are tiny white bumps that they may have on their face. Um, an interesting fact about milia, so the little white bumps that they have on their face, you can assure the parents if they do ask about this, what they are and that they will disappear over the coming weeks. Um, they will just kind of disintegrate underneath the skin. However, milia in infants and milia in adults are completely different. So milia in adults, they will be like hardened balls of sebum and they will have like almost like this casing over the skin and they look exactly the same except for an adult. They would need to go to an esthetician and have those uh, lanced and extracted out. Um, I know this because I'm an esthetician in two states. That was like my prior career. Um, and I was like, when I figured out that babies had milia, I was like, that's so weird. How did they disappear? Because the only way you can get them to disappear is um, to, in from what I've always known, is to extract them out with a lancet. But babies, they will naturally disintegrate underneath the skin. So you can reassure parents of this. The newborn rash is also um, sometimes like a common finding and it is a normal finding. It's not like something to be super, super alarmed about. You wanna assure that it is that newborn rash and not something serious that's different, um, no allergic reactions or anything like that. So if a parent asks about a particular rash, you can look at it and make your best judgment and just say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to get the best person to come look at this. I'm going to go talk to my nurse that I'm working with today and have her, her or him take a look. Um, again, that acrocyanosis is a normal and common finding. Lanugo is also a normal and common finding. And I put a photo of it here. I think Lanugo is actually really cute looking. Maybe I'm strange, but um, it's basically they come out and they have like extra fur, extra hair on them. And parents may ask, why is my baby so hairy? And you can just assure them that that will go away. It will, it will fall off um, throughout time um, and not like a long period of time that they have it at all. The vernix caseosa is also not a long period of time that not, that needs to stay on, but that has a lot of benefits that they have realized over time. Originally, babies were taken away from mom and they were given, you know, baths. I don't know how many years ago it was, um, but that's not what is done anymore. The vernix caseosa is left on the skin because it provides protection. It aids in thermoregulation. 
has antimicrobial properties for the neonates sensitive immune system. And it's that cheese like substance. You'll see that some babies come out with a lot of it and some babies come out with like a mild to moderate amount. But even so, you don't want to be taking that off the skin. You want to leave it there. Okay, genitalia and genitourinary. You want to take this one? Yeah, so um, with um, it's important to document the baby's first pee and poo. Um, so um, they should do it within the first like day, two days is kind of pushing it, but um, you should always like look out for that, ask mom or dad or whoever is um, taking care of the baby um, if they had their first pee. Um, they might have a pink tinged urine and you just want to let the parents know that it is normal um, and it is related to the hormones from mom when they when um, the mom gives birth. Um, also, um, a diaper, so what's normal for a baby to be um, peeing is a diaper a day for a first couple of days. Um, it can be, I think it's a diaper for however old the baby is. Um, so if the baby's two days, they'll have two diapers, three days, um, three diapers. And then, um, until, um, they're doing six to eight, then that's kind of more what mom will be seeing, especially when her milk has come, um, come in, um, and that will indicate adequate hydration and feeding. Um, it's also important to note that they might have that, um, brick dust which is um, from the uric acid crystals in concentrated urine. Um, and then also um, you want to know from the parents that they are planning to do a circumcision. Um, you need to, of course, um, they'll have to explain the procedure. You'll need the consent and then um, you'll have to um, monitor that site as well. So any redness, any type of um, discharge, any excessive bleeding, you want to note that. You also want to let um, the parents know to kind of look out for that site as well to see if there's any type of um, infection forming. Um, you also want to evaluate those femoral pulses. And then um, you want to look at the genitalia area um, to see if it's developing properly. There can be some swelling um, in the baby girls um, can be common and normal. It usually goes down. It's just from, I believe it's from mom's hormones. Um, when she gives birth, that kind of like feeds into the baby. Um, and then also there might be some ambiguous genitalia as well. So you might not know, um, you know, the, you might not know if it's, you know, a girl or a boy, and they might have to do an ultrasound on the baby to see what, um, you know, what organs they have, sex organs they have. So, um, you know, you also want to note that, let the physician know when you're doing your assessment that it is a little ambiguous. Um, and then, Natalie, can you note on the penile torsion? Yeah, and you guys, there is a whole bunch of different things that you might come across with genitalia development. These are just some things that I personally came across. Um, and so penile torsion and hypospadias. So that's where there's there's the line on the one shaft portion of the the penis. And if it twists one way, that's penile torsion. And it can be very mild too. Um, in the same with hypospadias, and this they're often accompanied as well. The hypospadias is where the urethral opening will be on the underside of the shaft, um, opposed at like right at the tip at the end. Um, and both of these can be like, you know, I had a question about this when I, you know, was doing my inspection and my overall assessment of my newborn and I brought it up to my nurse and the next diaper change we did, um, she, she took a look and she confirmed, yes, um, that that was the case. Um, but it can be, she said it was, it was actually really, really mild. And often th these things can just, they're fine to go 
without like having surgical repair, it can be very mild. But um, just having an awareness of like the different things you may see. Um, and these are just some that came up for me. Okay, so infant, infant safety. So important to know for infant safety, we have those hugs tags on baby. Um, so basically these are a way of making sure that there's no abduction, the alarms will go off if they go through certain doors. Um, funny story, I think that they are supposed to like notify security when the babies are being brought to well baby. Uh, nursery, if mom needs to like take a shower or something, often the babies are rolled out through their little, um, their bassinets and they're brought to well baby, right? And somehow I think it was like a nurse that I was working with um, had forgotten to like notify security and it did set the alarm off. Um, so just know that like that's one way of security that we have for infant safety while they're in the hospital. Another way of monitoring this is that they have matching ID bands with both mom and dad. So when they come back from well baby nursery, we make sure that we're giving the right babies back to the parents. Um, they always have that belt, that bulb syringe at the bedside um, if they need to clear the airway or anything like that. Um, again, you wanna always keep the cord dry. This plays into infant safety to avoid any infection risks. Um, and then we have this term back to sleep. You'll talk a little bit more about this in peds when you start going through your SIDS lecture. And if you're anything like me, you'll be a freak for the next month about um, if you work with babies or you work with children. Um, it just, it had me overthinking everything. Um, so this is a very scary uh, concept, but we put babies on their backs to go to sleep because it's a SIDS risk if we place them on their sides or prone, right? Breastfeeding, lactation. So breast normal, normal findings with breastfeeding. Do you wanna take this one, Isabella? Yeah, so um, at day one postpartum, the breast should be soft non-tender and producing colostrum. So colostrum is different from the breast milk. Um, it happen, it, um, it's kind of like the first, um, the first production before um, the milk comes in and it's gold. It has a ton of nutrients. It's not a lot and the baby only needs um, a little bit. So it's important to kind of show mom um, by doing that manual ex expression that um, it is colostrum and it might be different from, it might look different from the milk. Um, and it's okay if it's not like a lot that's coming out. Usually when we think of like breastfeeding, we think of like sh it shooting out, but um, the first um, few days, it's just the colostrum. So um, it's important to educate the mom on the manual expression expression um, and you'll see your nurses do it a lot but it's basically like kind of like um, I don't have like a something to demonstrate but you kind of want to put your hands around the boob you're not like grasping it like this but softly there and you're kind of just like massaging forward and um, it might not come out immediately you just want to keep on doing that expression until um you know the colostrum comes out from, um, from my yeah. memory that there is really excellent videos showing this um in mm -hmm. course modules and i'm assuming that she uploaded them for you guys um if you haven't gotten a chance to see those and really you know put your grasp that concept and like how manual expression is done you can definitely resource those um, but yeah, they only need for the colostrum, they only need that one to two teaspoons a day. So they might be, you know, a little anxiety ridden feeling like, well, I don't feel like my baby got anything. And you can just assure them that they're, the colostrum is like packed full of nutrients. It is gold, literally. Like they, they only need a tiny, tiny bit each day to make sure that they're nourished. Um, and then, and then the breast milk will proceed from there. 
Want to add anything else, Isabella? Well, I think just the, watching the videos of the expression is like the best way. There's no like right way to explain it until you see it. And then you're like, oh, okay. Um, but yeah, it shouldn't really be super uncomfortable for mom as well. It shouldn't, you don't want to be like massaging the boob forward because that can, you know, make, uh, it can cause soreness. Um, but you just want to like, like gently roll forward. Just if you, I just Googled before the session, I Googled the expression. I was like, oh, okay. Like I was trying to like read how to do it. And then I just Googled it and found a great video. Yeah. And there is really great videos too. I believe that they should be in modules for you guys if you haven't seen them yet too. Yeah. Videos are always super helpful. Okay. So the sex swallow reflex. Um, Preterms tend to struggle with this a lot early on. Um, when you get in the NICU, you might be seeing that they're supplementing a lot of uh, OG or NG to feeding um, because they they don't have the energy to, to be able to accomplish this reflex. So for the suck swallow reflex, babies are able to breathe through the nose simultaneously as they're feeding without choking. Um, the best way you can be sure that the baby has enough, um, like segue between the boob and the nose for them to breathe is if there's like a little triangle space of nostril that has an opening, that's enough to know that there's enough room there and that they are okay. Because that might be a concern with certain moms, especially with large breasts. They'll be like, oh my gosh, is my chest, you know, suffocating my baby? Um, you do want to make sure that you take a look and just say, okay, let's just tilt baby's head just a little bit this way. And just make sure that there's a little opening there that they're getting um, some breasts in. Breast engorgement can happen. Um, you want to encourage baby to breast as much as possible. You cannot spoil a neonate at this stage. They can be put to breast as much as mom wants to. Also, just having them laying there, you know, doing that skin to skin has those therapeutic uh, effects and it, its own benefits. Um, and even if baby, you know, just falling asleep there. If mom is falling asleep, however, we're going to say, okay, mom, we're going to move baby to the breast net because that's a safety risk, right? Um, you want to encourage the mom to try to breastfeed, um, at least every two hours. Um, and then again, you want to demonstrate and educate on that manual expression. If parents are asking about, uh, giving a bottle or a pacifier in the initial days, how would you respond? Hmm. Unmute yourself if you'd like, or you can write it in the chat. Just to offer the breast because there's, um the even if they're not trying to like necessarily breastfeed the baby it helps with the hormone production and helps the uterus to get back into the place it needs to get into mm -hmm. um and something else i don't remember but yeah <laughs> so yeah it's really important if they are planning to breastfeed because the second you give them that bottle or pacifier no good you want to educate that giving a bottle or pacifier in the early stages of life, especially in the first five days, will lead to confusion and complications for baby learning to latch on to mom's breast correctly. Um, this is awfully, often like the biggest challenge for both baby and mom is that latching, right? Um, and this could potentially lead to the, the inability for mom to be able to breastfeed if, if they were to give baby either a pacifier or the bottle because they won't get that concept down. Baby and mom together won't be able to do it. Um, so really important that we just encourage, you know, why don't we try to breastfeed or if they really just aren't having it at that moment, um, then just encouraging that skin to skin, maybe just some skin to skin and see where it goes. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit more, I think on one of the next slides about lactation consultants, we'll get there. But as far as the latch scoring, why don't you take this one, Isabella, you can take latch scoring. Yeah, so there's like a scoring system to kind of see how the baby is latching onto mom. And um, it will, I think, determine if they'll need the consultation or not. Um, so it's kind of nice that there's like, you know, this acronym here. So um, you want to know how they latch. Um, are they, you know, are they super motivated? Do they grasp down on the breast? 
do they have those like um, that rhythmic sucking, the tongue down, the lips in that like like position. <laughs> um, and then, um, you know, one is um, there's repeated attempts, there's kind of like, um, you know, some issues attaching, but they can hold the nipple in the mouth and there is that um, suck reflex. And there's the zero where they're just like, you know, the latch is not happening, they're too sleepy, or they just like, it's just too hard for the baby. Um, there's also the uh, audible swallowing. So, um, so that's part of that, like suck swallow reflex, and how we look at that. Okay. Um, so yeah, if it's confusing, can you so go over that one? Yeah. Yeah. So spontaneous and intermittent, if they are less than twenty four hours old. If it's spontaneous and frequent, meaning that like um you're hearing it spontaneously it's frequently that happening that um audible swallowing that gulp gulp right um if they have it spontaneous and frequent greater than 4 24 hours old that's great if they are less than 24 4 hours old it's spontaneous and intermittent that's also great if it's only a few and with stimulation so mom's doing that rooting to try to get baby to like start drinking right <laughs> um that's going to be given a one and then if they're just not they're just kind of like sitting on the breast they have their mouth on the breast but they're not swallowing they're not doing that suck swallow reflex then they're going to get a zero for none um and then also when you're doing the breast um you know examination when you're looking at the breast you want to look at the type of type of nipple they have is it everted um is it flat or is it inverted um, that can definitely change how they are breastfeeding with their baby. Um, also, the comfort um, for mom, you know, is, is they'll get a two if it's if their breasts are soft and non-tender. A one if you know it's it is their boobs are pretty or their breasts are are full. Um, if you see any like redden or small blisters or bruising, um, or if they have some discomfort, they'll get a one. And then a zero if they're like completely engorged, if there's like cracking and bleeding um, or large blisters or bruises. Um, if they do have that severe discomfort, we'll give them a zero. And then also the positioning as well. You'll see a lot of times like, um, you know, at first um, moms will, you know, need a full assist. So, um, you know, sometimes the mom will not know how to position the baby and the staff will literally grab the baby and, and put them in position. Um, and then you kind of just want to see over time if they'll um, progress from that. So sometimes the mom will need the minimal assistant and you'll want to give them a, a one if they need like, um, you know, a pillow. A lot of times a nurse will put a pillow under the arm or um, underneath the baby to support the baby in the mom's arm. Um, or sometimes like, you know, you'll see moms and they just like, you know, have it completely down. Though they won't need any assistance from staff or no um, type of support from a pillow or anything. So you kind of want to look at these different things and give the mom um, the appropriate score and that will determine if they will need that lactation consultant um, consult consultation or not. Great job. Yeah, I just want to make a point of saying that for this old positioning, um, it is highly unlikely unless they've had multiple pregnancies that they need no assist from the staff. Um, I've even had uh, multi paras come in and they still need that like minimal assist. Maybe it's like the muscle memory isn't quite there in that first day. Most of the time it's going to be a one or a zero. Um, and then just go circling back to the type of nipple, the one that, um, we will probably need those nipple shields for are either the inverted or flat. Um, yeah, great job. Okay, so for math, there will be a little bit of math on the exam. Um, some examples would be dimensional analysis, some simple math to calculate feedings. An example of a math question you might see on the exam might look something like this. So a nurse is preparing to administer RHD immune goblin 50 microgram IM injection to a client. Available is RH immune globulin 300 microgram per 2 ml. 
how many mls should the nurse administer and you're going to want to always round to the nearest tenth. what do you guys think 0 0.5 milliliters or oh, no, i'm sorry 0. 0.5 Zero point, uh... Take a moment to do the math. <laughs> you, there's no rush. Because you know, I always need to do it on a scratch of paper. Yeah, Benjilin, you got it. Just want to give a moment to anyone that was trying to jot it down and figure it out themselves. Okay, so dimensional analysis, right? And then we get 0.3 mLs. Good job. Okay, practice questions, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it in the recording. I think that it's fair game. Um, okay, so a nurse is preparing a list of self care instructions for a postpartum client who was diagnosed with mastitis. Which of the following instructions would be included on the on this list? And this is a select all that apply. Um, so take a minute to like think through these, and then let me see if I can. Do you do you have the option to create a poll, Isabella? Because I I think I might need to actually. If you don't see it, okay. Yep, yeah, I see. I can do it. Forget how to do select all that apply. So bear with me for a second, you guys, while Okay, I got it. Let me just select the ones that are correct. Hmm. Okay, okay, I got it. All right, now I'm going to open the poll. I'm just putting in like A, B, C, D, E, F. I'm not putting in the question or anything. Let me know if that comes up to you guys correctly. You guys see it? Cool. And go ahead and just submit whenever you're ready. You guys don't need the full five minutes for this because you had a couple minutes there while I was tinkering around getting it set. Uh, to take a look at the answers, the potential answers are wear a supportive bra, rest during the acute phase, maintain a fluid intake of at least 3,000 mils, um, continue to breastfeed if the breasts are not too sore, take, a prescribe, take the, the prescribed antibiotics until the soreness subsides or, and or avoid decompression, decompression of the breasts by breastfeeding or breast pump. Did you guys submit your answers? I did, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll. Hopefully, it's looking funny to me, so hopefully it went through right. seconds and then it should reveal what your guys' responses were. Okay, it's saying 100% no answer, so I don't know what happened. <laughs> um, okay, weird. That did that just failed. I don't know why. 
Okay. It's A, B, C, D. So rationale, client instructions include resting during the acute phase, maintaining a fluid intake of at least 3,000 mil a day, if not contraindicated, taking analgesics to relieve discomfort. Antibiotics may be prescribed and they are taken until they are the complete prescribed course is finished, not at any other point. Um, additional supportive measures include the use of moist tea or ice packs and wearing a supportive bra. Continued decompression of the breast by breastfeeding or breast pump is important to empty the breast and prevent the formation of an abscess. Now, for anyone that did not get the full ABCD, uh, Answer is correct. Does that all make sense? Here we go. Are you seeing the chat, Isabella? Okay, cool. I see one person say yes. Cool. Isabella, you want to read this question? And I'll try to get the, the poll corrected and going. So a client who is breastfeeding her newborn infant is experiencing nipple soreness. To relieve the soreness, the nurse suggests that the client avoid rotating breastfeeding positions, stop nursing until the nipple heals, substitute a bottle feeding until the nipple heals or position the infant with the ear, shoulder, and hip in straight alignment with the, stom with the infant's stomach against the mother. Okay, this is acting funky for me. Let's just use the chat to answer. Let's try for those who are still thinking about it. Don't look at the chat quite yet. When you're ready to answer, put it up in the chat. Sorry, guys. I don't know why it's being funky. I think something changed on the platform. Job, guys. The nurse would suggest the mother position the infant in this manner, rotating breast, feeding positions, breaking suction with the little finger, nursing frequently, begin feeding on the less sore nipple, not allowing the newborn to chew on the nipple or sleep, holding the nipple in the mouth and applying tea bags soaked in warm water to the nipple are also measures to alleviate nipple soreness. Great job. I think everyone got that correct, right? Cool. Um, all right, so a nurse is evaluating the mother-infant bonding process during the postpartum period. An indication of a maladaptive interaction would be if the mother, A, expressed discomfort with the role of the mother, B, encouraged the nurse to feed the baby because she continues to be too tired, C, showed that she was willing to learn how to care for the umbilical cord, or D, talked to the baby. So we're looking for an indication of a maladaptive interaction. Which one would that be? The tricky one. What do we got, Isabella? They still rolling in. Did a good amount of them put it in? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And what what is the primary answer that they're going with? <laughs> A's and B's. It's a tricky one. It's B, you guys. Okay, so an indication of a maladaptive interaction is refusal to interact with or care for the infant. Options C and D identify situations in which the mother plans to or is demonstrating interaction with the infant. Expressing discomfort with the role of motherhood is not maladaptive. It's just like it could be to the degree of like they're concerned that maybe they're not like a good mom, right? But if they're like verbally stating, you know, like, I'm too tired, I don't want to breastfeed, um, I don't want to like bond with my infant, that's, that's not a good sign. 
Does that make sense for those who answered A? Just want to make sure that you guys understood that and why. That's like that NCLEX style question, right? Tricky. Okay, you want to take this one as well? So it's been 12 hours since the client's delivery of a newborn. The nurse assesses the client for the process of involution and documents that it is progressing normally when palpation of the client's fundus is noted at which level? Okay, so 12 hours, same day. Get back to our involution slide that we were looking at. You guys are all over the place with this one. <laughs> it's okay. It's only week two. <laughs> we're just, yeah, we're just going to pop to the, ira the, the rationale. So it's at the umbilicus that first day. Um, I mean, there's a chance it could start descending down a little bit um, at that point, 12 hour point, but no, it's it's mostly gonna be right at the umbilicus level. The term involution is, is used to describe the rapid reduction in size and the return of the uterus to a normal condition, uh, similar to its pre-pregnant state. Immediately following delivery of the placenta, the uterus contracts to, to the size of a large grapefruit. Uh, the fundus is situated into the midline between the symphysis pubis and the umbilicus. Within 6 to 12 hours after birth, the fundus um, of the, the uterus rises to the level of the umbilicus. The top of the fundus remains at the level of the umbilicus for about a day, and then it starts to descend um, into the pelvis approximately one finger breadth, that one centimeter on each succeeding day. So one finger breadth, they say, is about centimeter, centimeter. Like one to two centimeters per day it comes down. Might be slightly different for each mom, too. Nothing's textbook. Make sense? Want to take this one, Isabella? So a nurse is performing an assessment on a two-day postpartum mother. The mother complains of severe pain and an intense feeling of swelling and pressure in the perineum. After hearing these complaints, the nurse specifically checks the client's episiotomy for drainage, rectum for hemorrhoids, vulva for hematoma, uh, or the vagina for laceration. Don't let this trick you. Just we're just using different terminology here. I think most important thing. When you said don't let this trick you, this that took away all my confidence. So then just want to let you know that. <laughs> I promise you guys, the, the questions won't be this tricky. I'm just doing this to help you with the HESI mostly. Um, but these are all the topics that, that you're covering this week and are important to know. So severe pain and intense feeling of swelling and pressure in the perineum. It's going to be C. There's going to be a potential hematoma, hematoma developing there. Um, it's suspected when the client reports pain or pressure in the vulvar area. We didn't talk about like vulva and use that terminology throughout all this. So that was like, all right, do you guys know what a vulva is? <laughs> now you do. Um, massive hemorrhage into the tissues can occur, resulting in hypovolemia and shock. Therefore, the client's complaints must be assessed so that interventions can begin immediately. Yep, and episiotomies are not really routinely done anymore. Sometimes, you know, parents may ask for an episiotomy, um, but the episiotomy isn't like something that is like draining per se like there you would check in you would check you know 
for episiotomies or lacerations, you're going to be checking the peri pad and looking at the bleeding and looking at the color of it and inspecting the smell. But for like pressure and swelling feeling, there is buildup happening at that site, which is indicative of that hematoma. Okay, this brings a qu a question from now because um, if the you said that moms are commonly allowed to just tear naturally because it it, it promotes better healing later, right? Um, exactly. What like terminology? Because I think that's what tripped me up in this one. I I felt like oh, the terminology is just episiostomy. A tear equals episiostomy, but that is not necessarily. Right. Episiotomy so, is literally that's the scalpel the surgeon's taking. He's slicing got the it. Of okay. that baby. And that's like something that they would routinely do. Um, and they do not anymore because right. some studies just like debunked like the effects of that being, you know, better it's for common, that. Right? And like, some some moms don't tear yeah. also. Like that's something to know. And some yeah. only tear a little bit. So why make this big cut? Right. And also just the way the um fibrin and all of that 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 healing process happens it happens at a better rate um when there's like a natural process to it basically right. so right. it's like don't mess with what you don't need to yeah. let the body do what it needs to do um and then you know the vulva is just talking about that that region down there the perineum uh just different terminology thank you so much for clarifying that mm -hmm. Okay, guys, good luck. Um, don't don't worry too much. It's her questions are very straightforward. They're not there to trick you. Um, go in with confidence. You know what you're doing. This has been all very on point to what you need to know. So use this as your study guide. Okay. All right, I'm gonna stop recording.